uh, Joshua chapter 11. And it came to pass. Whatever you're going through right now, it will pass. Some of you are going through some difficult stuff right now. It'll pass. The Lord will see you through this just like he has the last thing you went through. Uh, that's encouraging. And of course, we know there's other storms and circumstances on down the road. But whatever you're going through right now, it will pass. And it came to pass, chapter 11, Joshua, when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things, that he sent Jobab, king of Madon, uh, to the king of Shimron, to the king of uh, Aksaph, uh, Akshaph, and to the kings who were from the north in the mountains, in the plain south of Chinneroth, in the lowland, and in the heights of Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east, and in the west the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Jebusites, you want to circle that. These are the guys that they, they just can't seem to drive them out. They're going to finally take over Jerusalem, and it will be, well, it will go all, they will continue to occupy Jerusalem until David, the great king of Israel, runs them out, okay? Uh, the Jebusite in the mountains and the Hivite below Hermon in the land of Mizpah. So they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. And when all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to Joshua, don't be afraid because of them. Now, when the Lord says don't be afraid, why does he say that? Because you're afraid, right? Now, the Lord never says don't be afraid to someone that's not afraid. Now, he, they've had some great victories in the past, but now they've got so many uh, uh, kings coming against them at once that it's like sand on the seashore. And the Lord says to Joshua, verse 6, Don't be afraid because of them. For tomorrow about this time, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. And you shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly, by the waters of Miram, and they attacked them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook of Mizraphoth, and, and to the valley of Mizpah eastward. They attacked them until they left none of them remaining. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. So just a few details to pull out of this. News of Israel's triumph caused the kings of the north to confederate. The, the, you know, the last big uh, fight that, that, that we covered, God had these hailstones that were like cinder blocks falling out of the sky, right? And just wiping out the enemies of Israel. And so everyone's hearing about this in the north. So they confederate, and God tells Joshua exactly what he wants him to do. Note that Joshua didn't argue with God. He didn't say, well, I don't, you know, do we have to hamstring the horses? I mean, you know, I, I, you know how I love animals, Lord, and uh, uh, that seems like a cruel thing to do to the horses. And, I mean, do we have to burn the chariots? I mean, uh, we could use those chariots. Those chariots would, would help us in war. He didn't argue with God. He didn't halfway obey what God told him to do. He completely obeyed the word of the Lord. God told him, and he did it. And what does it mean to hamstring the horse as well? To cut a tendon in the leg that would disable the horse from running. And so it was actually kind of a merciful thing to do to the horse so they don't have to go into battle anymore. And they could just kind of feed and, and uh, multiply and all of these types of things. But they're not used in combat or, or war anymore. And of course the chariots, God said, burn them and they burned them. And because Joshua obeyed, the Lord delivered. The Lord delivered. Look at verse 8. And the Lord delivered them. The Lord delivered them. And, and, and guys, listen, the reason why we don't see God delivering us sometimes is because we just don't trust and obey. The same if you're listening to that. If God tells us to do something, we just need to be obedient in it, right? And we have the tendency sometimes as Christians to say, well, I'm not going to obey God in this regard, but I'll do this. 
it's like a fair exchange kind of a thing. You know, I'm not going to do this that you told me to do, but I'll do this over here. And God says, well, I didn't tell you anything about this over here. And this right doesn't cancel out that wrong. Whatever God tells us to do, we just need to do it, right? And when we obey God, we have positioned ourselves for him to deliver us. And God delivering us is just another way of saying God blessing us, right? How many of you have felt blessed by God at one time or another in your Christian walk? Was it in a time when you were living in disobedience or obedience? Obedience, right? Why, why, why do we note that? Because God can't keep from blessing an obedient life, and he cannot bless a disobedient one. He can't bless a disobedient one. Last night, the men and I, as we were praying, we were praying about folks that we haven't seen at church in, in some time, and, and, you know, there are times when the church is like, well, what are we doing wrong, and how have we failed these people, and so forth. But, you know, the, the, the way the discussion went last night, it was, we knew of people that are not in church because they are living in sin. They've just got some sin in their life they're not ready to part with. They're not ready to put it away. They're not ready to give it all to God. And, and, and so it was like the, you know, and they have enough fear of God. They don't want to go to a church when they're doing all this stuff that God's told them not to do or, or, or whatever. And, and aren't we all that way to some extent? It's like, well, I've got this situation I don't feel real good about. It. I think I'll just skip church this week. And, and it, it's like an intuitive thing, isn't it? We know that when we're living in disobedience, God can't bless that. Well, Joshua completely obeyed the Lord, and the Lord delivered them, is what verse 8 says. Now, verse 10, Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazor and struck its king with the sword, for Hazor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. This is the big shot of the north, right? And they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them, and there was none left breathing. And then he burned Hazor with fire. That's like, well, let's, let's really make a show of this. Let's just scorch the city. So all the cities of those kings and all their, uh, all their kings Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword, he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hazor only, which Joshua burned. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock the children of Israel took as uh, booty for them. Say, everyone laugh. <laughs> ah, they took as spoils of war, if you will, all right, for themselves. But they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they left none breathing. As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And so now we see in the, this text that it wasn't just obeying the Lord. This goes all the way back to Moses' leadership. It was like Moses said, now listen, I'm about to, I can't go into the promised land, Joshua. The Lord's already told me I've got to die on this mountain up here, and you're about to take over. And let me tell you, when you go in there, clean house. You, you need a clean house. And this was Moses trying to make things easier on Joshua, giving him some clear leadership instruction. It was all obviously of the Lord, right? Uh, when I think back to the, the Calvary Chapel in Murfreesboro, right as I was handing this ministry off to my right-hand guy, Kent Unclesby, who's doing a marvelous job there, by the way, I didn't want to leave him in a, in, in a bad predicament. We had a couple in the church, and they were, they were known to fleece the flock. Uh, they, they, they would go to people for handouts all of the time. As a matter of fact, down the street from the church, there was a Chevron station, and it, it was almost humorous because they would they, they were better greeters than our greeters. You understand? Now the new people came to the church, they saw an easy mark, you know, and they'd come and they'd pile up to them and everything, and they'd have either uh, the, their their child would come, well, we don't have enough money for fuel to get home, or, and we would see the new people filling up their tank with gas, you know, at this Chevron station, and they they they, would, they just fleeced the flock. I, Mona and I met y'all smiling. You know exactly who I'm talking about here, right? And uh, yeah, they're just fleecing the flock. And I knew before I left, I don't want to leave Kent in a predicament here. So we called this family in the office, the elders and I, and we said, all right, enough's enough. Don't ask anybody else for help. We've helped you plenty. 
You need to stand on your own two feet and take care of yourself. No more asking any. Don't share your sob story. Don't have your child share your sob story. Y'all need to get jobs, go to work, or you need to go somewhere else. If you won't behave, you just need to go. And boy, that sounded harsh. But you know, after I left and came down here, I, I didn't have any concern about how I left Kent. Uncles, but he's, he, he had enough challenges without having to deal with this. See, and it's kind of the same thing. Moses didn't want Joshua to have an extra, uh, you know, issue that would just be like a thorn in his side. So he said, listen, when you go in, you better clean the house. Get, get, get the trouble people out. That's, that's what Moses said to, uh, to, to Joshua. And then verses 16 through 20, boy, these are disturbing verses, I think, to some people. Then Joshua took all this land, the mountain country, all the south, all the land of Goshen, the lowland, and the Jordan plain, the mountains of Israel and its lowlands, from Mount Halak and the ascent to Seir, even as far as Baal Gad and the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and struck them down and killed them. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings, and there was not a city that made peace with the Hivite, uh, with the children of Israel, except the Hivites and the inhabitants of Gibeah and all the others they took in battle. Here's the troubling verse. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them and that they might receive no mercy but that he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, that's kind of a troubling verse, isn't it, at verse 20? Because at a glance, this is the way it reads. God says, oh, well, all your enemies, I'm going to make them keep fighting you so I can just wipe them all out. All these poor innocent people that don't really have an issue with Israel at all, I'm going to have them get their back up against Israel, and they are not going to... Uh, to, to subside or, 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 or pull back or anything like that. And, and I'm going to harden their hearts so much that they just keep coming after you and so you have a good excuse to just wipe them out. Because that's, that's kind of the way it reads, right? But that's not the way the original language translates. The phrase harden their hearts in Hebrew is the word, uh, it's actually two Hebrew words, chazak lab. Would you say that with me? Chazak Lab, very good. And Chazak Lab means this. It means to strengthen and to fortify and to maintain the present will and feelings. Let me say that again. It means to strengthen, to fortify, to maintain the present uh, will and feelings. In other words, God says, I'm not going to take innocent people and make them hate you for no reason. They already hate you, and I'm just going to put a little wood on the fire. You understand? Now, that's important for us to know. Why? Because God doesn't entrap anybody. He, he, he doesn't. He never has entrapped people. God says, listen, whatever condition you're in, I'll come alongside and I'll, I'll just put a little, little wood on the fire, so to speak. And if there's, you know, we see a negative version of this, I think, in verse 20, but isn't there a positive side of this as well? If you take one step th towards the Lord, if you have a heart for God, He'll strengthen and fortify and maintain that desire and build on it and give you greater wisdom and give you renewed experiences with Him and so forth and so on. How many of you have experienced that in your Christian journey? See, there's some people that read their Bible and say, well, I'm just not getting anything out of this. And they put it down. I mean, it just takes, it takes very little to get them to put the Bible down. Isn't that something? And there's some people that say, I want to know God. I want to know his will for my life. I want to know what this Bible is all about. I want to know Jesus, the one that I've committed my life to. And I have determined in my will that I'm going to get to know this, this, this holy Bible that I have in my hand. When someone has that kind of conviction of heart, God says, you know what, I'm going to come alongside that. I'm going to give you what you need to, to follow closely after me. Some of you have experienced that in your life. Others of you, um, you need to hear what the Spirit says to the church. Sometimes we make excuses for why we don't follow through with things. 
Sometimes we make excuses for why things are not happening in our life. We've prayed about it, and we didn't get an answer. We didn't get the answer we wanted. And if we would look into our heart honestly, we would have to acknowledge, well, I prayed about it, but I didn't pray about it diligently because I guess I didn't really want it as bad as I thought I did. Right? I mean, all of us pray these prayers when we're backed into a corner. Oh, no, God. You know, I mean, we sound like Moses himself when we're in the midst of a trial, right? We're, we're, we're praying the right way. I mean, if anybody, anybody was eavesdropping on our prayers, they're like, man, that sister really loves the Lord. That brother is really serious about God. But what happens once the, you know, a little bit of the stress and the circumstances are lifted? We go right back to complacency. I mean, we just fall right back into, you know, just, just a kind of a casual relationship with the Lord. And the Lord says, well, if you're casual with me, I'll just put a little wood on the fire. You'd be even more casual. In fact, I'll help you find a church where it's easy to be casual. Where they just tell you something nice every week, and they never step on your toes. They just tell you it's okay to do this and live in this situation, and that you don't have to worry about that. And, and, and there are churches where people are just very casual in their walk with God, right? And they're surrounded by others of this sort, so they don't even really even think about it, because everyone around them is very similar to that. Well, he hardened their hearts, he strengthened, he fortified, he maintained their will and their feelings. There's a verse that we just kind of slid past here, though, that I, I want to go back and pick up for emphasis. Verse 18, Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. A long time. See, we read a verse, we go, God, I don't understand why you won't do something for me. I mean, Joshua prayed, he put his trust in you, and ten minutes later, you just delivered all these kings into his hand, and why haven't you answered me? It has been 43 minutes since I prayed this prayer, Lord. Why can't you turn this spouse around? I've been praying for Tammy for 27 years. <laughs> you know I'm kidding. But don't we get impatient with God and we pray these kinds of prayers and we think that everybody in the Old Testament, everybody in the Bible, boy, they just prayed and God showed up and saved the day and just happened like that, right? We just skim right over a verse. I mean, think of how long it took us to read that verse. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. About five seconds to read the verse. It probably took him 15 years of fighting. And sometimes they were on the run, and sometimes they're in caves hiding out. And, and Joshua, is, and of course, we don't have this recorded for us, right? But Joshua prayed the same kind of prayers that we pray. God, I'm doing everything that I think you want me to do, and it still doesn't seem to be working out, right? And say amen. <laughs> You're doing what you know to be doing, and it still doesn't seem to be turning around. Well, the reason that's the case, guys, is because this Christian life that we're living in the Shadowlands Earth, you know, it's, it's just a patient, long obedience, just doing the right things because God's Word says it's the right things. And things don't turn around in, on an, in an instant. And the reason they don't is God wants to test our hearts. Are we really yielded to Him? Are we going to stick with it, you see? Well, verses 21 through 23, And at that time Joshua came and cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities, and none of the Anakim were left in the land uh, of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and then the land rested from war. And then chapter 12 is just kind of like a summary of the conquest. Look at, I'm just going to read a, ah, three verses. The first verse says, These are the kings of the land whom the children of Israel defeated, and whose land they possessed on the other side of the Jordan toward the rising of the sun, from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon and all the eastern Jordan plain. Uh, skip down to verse 4. Uh, the other uh, king was Og, king of Bashan and his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants 
who dwelt in Ashtaroth and at Dre. And, at, at, at Dre. and then finally, the last verse in this chapter, uh, the king of Terza, verse 24, 1, all the kings, 31. So we have a summary in chapter 12. There were 31 kings that they had to take on. And if that's not enough, what did we note in the, the last few verses of chapter 11 and, and uh, King Og? We, we noticed that there were Anakim in the land. Did you see that? Back in chapter 11, verse 21 and 22, the Anakim were in the land. What were the Anakim? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 3. Everyone say Genesis 3. Very good. That's how I know you're still with me. Genesis chapter 3, why were there Nephilim? Why were there Anakim in the land? That's a, that's a good question to ask because it's a recurring thing throughout the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is after Adam and Eve have eaten the forbidden fruit. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and now God is about to give a, a punishment to the serpent in verse 15. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity, that means bitter hostility in the Hebrew, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Notice seed is capitalized in the second instance. This is the first um, um, hint of the virgin birth, because it's seed absent the seed of man. That's the way it translates in the Hebrew. He, that is the serpent, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He shall bruise your head. Excuse me, he is speaking of the seed of the woman. Uh, the, the Messiah shall crush you in the headship, and you, the serpent, shall bruise or bite at his heel. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see now that the serpent knows that his defeat is coming through this woman. Knows that his defeat is coming through the woman. So as Genesis, Genesis chapter 3 comes to a close, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, back to the land, uh, back to the, the place, the ground from which they were taken. They weren't made from the dirt in Eden. That's, that's altogether different kind of soil, right? That's in heaven now, we think. But Genesis chapter 4, they've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Um, uh, they were eavesdropping, listening to God speaking to the serpent, and they thought, no, wait a minute here. Through us is going to come somebody that's going to crush the serpent and get us back into the garden. That's what Adam and Eve. And so Adam and Eve decided to have children. Uh, uh, now Adam knew Eve, his wife. That's the word yada in Hebrew. It means to know intimately, physically, uh, uh, emotionally, sexually, uh, so forth and so on, right? So he knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and Abel, right? These two sons. And, and, and the, the serpent is like, wait a minute, one of those two sons is going to do me in. So Cain comes against Abel and kills him. And the serpent was smiling. Ah, stopped it. Stopped my demise from coming. And what the serpent couldn't see is that they were going to have a third son named Seth. And it was in his days that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Then you fast forward several hundred years. Well, almost a thousand years into this earth project now. And... The whole earth is overrun with these Nephilim types of things. Look at Genesis chapter 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, and that's an Old Testament reference to angels, in every place it shows up, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took, that's, that Hebrew word means they forcefully took, they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. Let me read verse 4 again. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. Everyone say, and also afterward. And also afterward. That means this is pre-flood. Pre-flood, 
angels were taking earth women, they were having children by them, and these half-angelic, half-human, well, we called them giants, right? But uh, the Bible calls them great ones in the Hebrew, Nephilim. These, these were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, verse 4, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old. And that in the Hebrew means men of myth, like Hercules and the Titans and Atlas, the sons of the gods, if you will. Do you know that every ancient culture has some history of these gods that came down and cohabited with earth women and produced these bizarre offspring? Even Native American, in, you know, here in the, you know, America, uh, Native Americans... Uh, they had a they knew how to spot them. They had six fingers, right? And so, if you came upon a, a creek bed or whatever, and you're going to water get to drink water for you and your horse, you know, a, a Sioux Indian or whatever, and you saw someone else on the other side getting a drink of water, you'd raise up your hand. How? Yeah, you know, peace, right? And and the reason they held up their hand was you could count fingers. I'm I'm one of you, right? And if you study the history of these Nephilim, they were, they were the first, the first history that we have of cannibalism is them. They had voracious appetites. I mean, they ate themselves into uh, extinction, if you will. And, and so Genesis chapter 6, the whole earth presumably is just contaminated with this Nephilim kind of a bloodline. And when it says that Noah was blameless in his days, it does not mean to say that Noah was this perfect guy. I think what it actually means to say is that Noah was an uncontaminated gene pool. He was still just a, just a, a flesh and blood human being, no angelic, nothing like that. And so God, because the, the enemy is trying to keep from his demise, you see. And so the enemy just, he's trying to contaminate the whole human race with this angelic human cohabiting and all of this. It's bizarre stuff, isn't it? Right? You need to know there's some people that look at this and say, I don't know, the sons of God means the sons of, you know, Seth and the daughters of Cain. And Well, that, that would not explain uh, people of abnormal size and so forth. And there are historic digs all over the earth where they have uh, covered and found the remains of these Nephilim, 9 feet, 10 feet, 13 feet, up to 20 feet tall. Just, just bizarre stuff, right? So God says, I'm just going to wipe everything out. He floods the earth. He only saves Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. So God starts over. That's, that's a sweet sound, isn't it? Now, the other baby that was making noise, that was disruptive, but that's my granddaughter. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding, Alan, out there. So God just kind of starts fresh with Noah and his wife and kids, right? But the verse in Genesis chapter 6 verse uh, uh, 4 said that there were giants in those days and also afterward. That means after the flood, this happened again. Sons of God taking the daughters of men. And now all the way in Joshua chapter 11 and 12, we hear about these Anakim. And the reason they're not called Nephilim is because their father, Anak, was a Nephilim. And so they just adopted the name Anakim. These are the sons of Anak. And they were giants. We read that Og was, was, was one of the giants in the land, a remnant of the giants. And we see in our passage that they drove them out of everywhere but about Ashdod and and, uh, oh, what was the other one in Gaza? What was the name of the city in Gaza? Gath. Gath is a Philistine city, and guess who comes from the city of Gath later on in the Bible? Goliath. And he had four other brothers, right? That's the reason David took five smooth stones. He had one for Goliath's forehead, and he had one for the, the forehead of his brothers, if they showed up too, right? And these guys were of enormous size, enormous size, and it's going to continue to show up all throughout the Bible. And why was this happening? Well, Numbers 13, when the spies went into the land and came back and reported to Moses and everything, they said the, the Anakim, the Nephilim, they were there, and we were like grasshoppers compared to them. And that lets you know just how big these fellows were, right? So again, that, and let's kind of put it all together. 
why were these giants in the land of Canaan? Because again, this is the land where the people are going to come and make their home, where the Messiah is going to come out of the land of Judah, out of the place called uh, Bethlehem and Jerusalem. This is all key real estate, right? And so the serpent is saying, wait a minute here. I don't know where the bloodline of this woman is going to produce this Messiah that's going to crush me is coming from. But I'd better have as many giants in the land as possible to just try and keep things stalled out. Okay. Now, having shared that, by the time you get to the days of Christ, there are so many demon-possessed people. Have you ever wondered why Jesus had to cast out so many demons, so many unclean spirits, evil spirits? And where do these evil spirits come from? Because an evil spirit or an unclean spirit is not the same thing as a demon. Do you understand that? An evil spirit or an unclean spirit, that's not the same thing as a demon. Demon means little devil, right? And we would use demon or devil to speak of fallen angels. An unclean spirit well, we believe that's the disembodied spirit of these nebula. They're kind of stuck between heaven, hell and earth or whatever if, because they are half human and half angelic, the spirits of these things, right? Now, that's, that's interesting. I, if you, listen, if you don't agree with me, I'm probably wrong. Right? But we've got these things in the land. Why? Because Satan knows that his... His defeat is going to come through the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman, they're going to get into this place called the land of Canaan. And the land of Canaan was just covered up in these Nephilim, these Anakim. These, uh, in another place, they're called the Zamzumim, right? And isn't it interesting today, we hear all these crazy reports of extraterrestrials that take by force women. And all the, you know, as much as I can say, because it's children here, right? But are extraterrestrials really taking captive earth women? Absolutely not. It is, it's fallen angels masquerading as extraterrestrials, right? That's perhaps what is happening. And why are we seeing an escalation in reports like this? Because, back to Genesis 3, we know that the seed of the woman is going to be going head to head with the seed of the serpent. We covered it this last Wednesday night. That this man we call Antichrist, this man that Revelation calls the beast, he is actually the offspring, he is a Nephilim, his father is the devil himself, the fallen angel we call Lucifer. And I hope you'll come this Wednesday night so you can hear more about all of these types of things. But let me just close things out by saying this. God promised victory, and we have at the end of chapter 12, 31 instances of God's faithfulness over a long time. And when you get to the end of your life, Christian, you're going to look back on 31, 41, 101, 1001, you're going to look back on a multitude of victories in which God came through in the nick of time. I know it gets frustrating that he waits until the last moment, but he comes through, amen? amen. So whatever you're going through today, get your eyes on him. And don't look at the giant. The reason David was able to take Goliath out is because David was, had his eyes on the God of Israel. And compared to the God of Israel, well, this giant's nothing at all. Nothing. He didn't even have to go in with armor or swords or bows or spears. He just went in with a sling and some smooth stones he got out of a, out of a creek bed. Why? Because he who is with us is greater than he who is in the world. We're not on the run. Now, we may be working behind enemy lines, because the days are getting short before all this culminates. But we're not uh, overpowered in any way, shape, or form. If God is with us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Lord, we love you.